Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Father John Wilson on here on this uh, Easter Monday. Um, forgive me as I get my camera kind of uh, situated as best as possible here. Um, but I wanted to, you know, we're talking about the Gospel of John and the the resurrection accounts in John's Gospel. This is the beginning of our uh, Easter Bible study, um, and I. Um, Hope this is good. We can make this uh, interactive. I hope these episodes aren't going to be too long. We'll see how this one goes, and uh, I'll I'll adjust as as possible. But please give me your comments, give me your questions, give me your feedback in the the comments section or by messaging me directly. Uh, so I've, I'm, I want to be kind of ambitious today. I want to get through nine verses. Uh, nine verses in maybe 10, 15 minutes. We'll see if we can do it. Uh, but this is um, John's Gospel, uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. And uh, I'm using the um, Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition Bible, if you're reading along at home. I mean, any translation is probably will probably work. Um, but here we go. Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20. Verses 1 through 9. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up into a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Sorry, this is verse 10. We'll go verses 1 through 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do for, uh, for today is just um, give you all like five basic observations. Uh, about these uh, these verses, um, so you know, take them as as you will, and you know, stop and reflect on them. These are just like little nuggets for further respect, further um, reflection, so that we can actually start to pray with the scriptures. Um, and first is just kind of a a bit of an introduction to John's gospel, at in general. Um, John's Gospel is um, is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece of world literature. There is, it's so beautifully written, and there is not a single word uh, that is out of place. It, it's always been recognized, um, even among the four Gospels. Um, you know, of course, all four Gospels are are perfect in the sense that all four of them are inspired by the Holy Spirit and. Um, contain the truth about who Jesus Christ is. Uh, but John's Gospel, even among the four Gospels, has been always been loved for the, its theological depth. John is a theologian, and he, he, he pulls out some of the deepest meaning um, from our Lord's words and actions, you know, in, in a special way. Um, and, you know, because of that, um, some biblical scholars of a more kind of skeptical attitude um, have sometimes tried to say that, well, you know, John's, John's gospel isn't quite as historical. It's more of a theological, kind of a free-form theological reflection on, uh, on Jesus in general, as opposed to a historical account of what happened. And, uh, you know, I think 
that's not the way to see it. And serious biblical scholarship recently has been walking that back in a big way. Because, I mean, think about it this way. Like a master storyteller, someone who knows deeply his subject, like doesn't need to make anything up, right? Because he sees, he can see like in the true details, the you know, the, the depth of meaning and what they really say about what's going on. Uh, so just because John notices details and tells stories from Jesus' life and public ministry that, that some of the other gospel writers don't, uh, doesn't mean his, his gospel is any less historical. Um, he is just, he's just a master storyteller. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um... What's the, the first plain fact of the resurrection account? Um, it's, it's the empty tomb. Um, it's interesting, none of the Gospels, when they start to tell the story of the resurrection, um, say, well, okay, well, and then on Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the tomb and the stone rolled away and this is what it was like. Uh, no, they don't, they don't start that way. They start with the empty tomb, and they start even more specifically with what it was like for those first disciples to, to hear the news. Um, you know, they probably couldn't even put into human words what the actual moment of the resurrection was like. I mean, imagine John asking the risen Jesus, so, Lord, what was it like for you to rise from the tomb? I mean, how, how could you even express that? in human words. Um, no, the gospel writers start from the witness of the apostles. You know, they're the witnesses to the empty tomb. Uh, they're receiving the news as they receive it and, and telling us their story. Uh, and, you know, in a way that we can even see ourselves in them. Um, you know, we, we can imagine what it was like for them to hear the news of the resurrection. And we can see even their experience uh, mirrored in our own lives. Um, think about it this way. Um, there is evidence and solid convincing evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ all around us, right? You know, and th those of us who, who know him know that. Um, but none of us are actually going to get to see the resurrection until we experience it ourselves at the end of our lives and at the end of all time. All right, so that's number two, the empty tomb. Um, third observation, uh, the characters in, in, this, in these verses. We've got three of them, right? We've got... Uh, Mary Magdalene, we'll talk about her a lot tomorrow. Um, but then we've got uh, St. Peter. And then the, um, this other guy, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, this is, you know, it's interesting. St. John, the apostle, the gospel writer, never actually mentions himself by name in his gospel. He always refers to himself as as the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, it's an interesting name to give yourself, right? Um, and but we, we can kind of we can kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, it's interesting in John's gospel, you always see this kind of you see you always see Peter and the beloved disciple, Peter and John together. And, and sometimes in ways that seems almost like a competition, right? You know, here they're, they're running to the tomb. And John makes sure to tell us that he ran faster and he got there first. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a competition. It's a complementarity. And you see that it throughout the John's Gospel, and especially here, that it's almost always the case that, that John is the first one to perceive what's happening. But then Peter's the first one to act. So John, he gets to the tomb first. 
he sees inside. He actually waits for Peter, and Peter is the first one to enter the tomb. It's interesting, John kind of acknowledging Peter's authority to be that first witness. Um, so Peter enters the tomb first, then John enters, but John is actually the first one to, to perceive and to believe uh, what had happened. And if we talk about John as the beloved disciple, you know, yeah, he's got that like interior perceptivity, that reception to the love of Jesus that, that Jesus recognized and that, you know, God had put within him to be, you know, to have that, to be really our model in, in that interiority, in that contemplative life. Um, Peter's the, the active one, right? Sometimes that gets him in trouble. But, you know, the, the, the fathers of the church have these, these beautiful reflections on Peter and John. How John is the model of the contemplative life. Think of like cloistered religious. And Peter is the model of the, the active apostolate. Um, and of course he's the one who's our, who's our first pope. So that's, that's, that's number three. Peter and John. Um, fourth observation. Uh, really, really interesting detail in these verses. Uh, do you, do you notice how often John mentions the linen cloths lying there? You know, like these would have been the burial, like shroud and bands and even like the, the, the face covering that Jesus was wrapped in. Um, and he, like he, he, he mentions these, these, these cloths several times. It's like he's really trying to point to them. And there's a, there's a, probably a number of different reasons why he's doing this. Um, first of all is to give us the, the, the clearest, the first and clearest evidence that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. That it wasn't just like, like Mary Magdalene assumed at first that someone had stolen his body, right? Because if you're going to steal a body, you're just going to take it covered in what it's covered in, right? Um, but if Jesus himself had rose, well, yeah, he would have laid aside. The things that had covered his body. So it, it's, it's a piece of evidence that it's a rising and not a robbery. Um, there's an interesting contrast here too with uh, earlier in John's Gospel. Um, when Jesus rose his friend Lazarus from the dead. Remember how, how that, that, that rising was described. Jesus calls him to come out and Lazarus emerges from the tomb, but he's still actually like covered with those linen wrappings. And Jesus actually has to tell people like, okay, now go unbind him, right? Lazarus rose from the tomb by, not by his own power, but by Jesus's power. So he had to be unwrapped. Jesus rose from the tomb by his own power. So he just laid aside his wrappings. And, you know, this is a bit more speculative, why John calls attention to these linen cloths. Uh, but I wonder, and others have wondered, if this, the way he calls attention to them is also almost kind of like a, a cameo, right? You know how in a movie where, you know, there's, you know, maybe you've got, you got the movie stars, right? But then you've got some other really famous actor who has a, like this little bit part. We call it a cameo, right? He's probably paid a million dollars just to appear in this movie for 15 seconds. Why? Because people, people think it's cool to see, oh, like, hey, there's that famous movie star over there. Um, there are cameos in the Gospels. Um, like, remember when the, the Passion, Jesus carrying his cross is being related. And... Right, you, um, Saint Simon of Cyrene is is conscripted into helping Jesus carry his cross, and I, I forget which gospel it is, but Simon is identified in that moment as the father of Alexander and Rufus. It's like, okay, why why, why do we care who his kids are in this moment, right? Uh, well, no, they're, they're mentioned because that first generation of Christians would know exactly who Alexander and Rufus were. They, they, they were 
members of the first community, right? So people reading this, like they, that's how they would have identified Simon of Cyrene. Oh, he's, yeah, he's Rufus's dad. All right, so like Alexander and Rufus just kind of make a cameo in, in that account because people would have recognized them. Well, um, we have in our church relics that have long, long claimed to be the shroud, the burial bands, the face cloth, um, the, the shroud of Turin um, has long been revered as the actual um, the actual linen covering of Jesus' body. Um, it, th these, these coverings may have been collected, may have been revered by the, the church in that first generation. And, you know, John may have been like, actually, hey guys, look, no, this is the, this is the shroud. This is the shroud that, that we have over there now that we revere as this you know, relic of the passion. Uh, so it might be making a little cameo there. <sighs> okay, so that's number four. Just the, the, the linen wrappings. <sighs> number five. And I know I'm going on a little long, but um, this, this, this is a, a really important verse to unpack. Um, verse nine. Um, so eight and nine. Then the other disciple, John, who reached to the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. All right, so he's the first one to actually kind of put it all together. Like, oh yeah, he's actually risen from the dead. But then verse 9 kind of almost like upends that. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So like he saw and believed, but he still didn't know that he had to rise from the dead? What's going on here? Well, um, let's not let the translation confuse us. Like, for, you know, this, this English word for, like, the Greek word is, you know, there's some kind of connection between these, these two sentences, you know, understood by the Greek word gar, which is translated for, but it's not necessarily an opposition or a, a or a or a clear causal thing. Um, and, okay, so, but what's going on? He believed and he still did not understand. And uh, guys, our parish emergency phone is ringing right now. So I'm gonna say goodbye to you and we'll pick this up tomorrow. God bless.